one trip or another we met Elvis it was um, one of the highlights of our visit it was funny because by the time we got near his house we forgot where we were going we were in this Cadillac limousine and you know what it's like in LA everything goes round and round and round and round and then we I think we're going along Mulholland he had his a TV going all the time which is what I do anyway and in front of the TV he had a massive big bass amplifier fender bass amplifier or just a fender amplifier so the bass plugged in it and he's playing bass all the time with the uh, the picture off on the TV <laughs> <laughs> so we just got in there and uh, played with him, you know, we all plugged in what was ever around, we all played and sang. I never jammed with Elvis at all. No, no. He, John said he did on the John interview. jammed with Elvis. Yeah, it must have been he when we went out, out of the room. Secretly at night. I think it was because he had a bass there, you know, so I thought... The basement. Right, well, you know, bass, hey, this is interesting. I think I was playing bass. football with him though. Yeah, I played <laughs> football with Elvis. I don't remember, I spent most of the party trying to suss out from his gang if anybody had any reefer. <laughs> Elvis Presley is big around the world, my friend. I'm you familiar can, with his work, okay? There, I do shoot in the Ed Sullivan Theater, so don't lecture well, me I'll, on Elvis I'll Presley, buddy. Say, you can actually take people that have never spoken the English language and never seen modern technology, and you just show a guy with sideburns and those high collars from the Vegas era, and they say, love me tender. <laughs> All shook up. Exactly. You go to the Andaman Hound Islands dog. in the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. Hound dog. Suspicious minds. I was just curious whether... Even to this day, Elvis is still a phenom down in Australia. Let me put it this way. Elvis is as big as he ever has been. And much of that credit goes to the guy I played in this movie, which is Colonel Tom Parker. People um, don't know much about the Colonel. Give us a little uh, CV here. Colonel Tom Parker was a carnival operator guy who was in the business of promoting the likes of Edward Arnold, Hank Snow, Jimmy Rogers Snow. And he took one look at this young kid from Memphis, Tupelo by way of Memphis, saw his effect as he was singing on the audience, mostly of women, girls and women, mm -hmm. and realized he had perhaps, this was perhaps the greatest carnival attraction on the planet. He had no other clients, and Elvis never had any other promoter or manager, I will say promoter more than manager. And he was both a genius and a scoundrel. He was both a very a disciplined man and also a guy that you might want to check your wallet to see if you still have all those fives and tens. You might want to do that. We were asking him about this, just making movies and, you know, not doing any personal appearances or TV. And he seems to enjoy, you know, I think he enjoys making movies so much because we couldn't stand not doing personal appearances, you know. He says he misses it a bit, you know. He's just, no, he was great, you know, it's just how I expected him. Eight of Glass Onion on John Lennon. So I'm happy to sneak one more episode in before the end of this uh, weird, surreal year. Possibly the most surreal year of most of our lives. Although I suppose people who lived through the world wars might disagree with that. But as a photo meme said recently, 2020 is over if you want it. And it'll be over in a day or so. Who knows what the new year will bring. Perhaps a return to normality. Or a return to abnormality, as I call it. Just before I go to the clips and today's episode, I was very interested to see last week the Get Back Sneak Peek, the five minute or so video introduced by Peter Jackson. Of course, the film is upcoming next year. Now, the thing that you will get from this video, and I made a few light-hearted, sarcastic remarks on social media about how smiley the video is and that maybe they collated all the smiles from the entire month and put it in one five minute video. <laughs> But uh, I was reflecting on it, and I, was, I also commented later that I don't really care what narrative they're spinning, I'll be honest. I mean, I listened to the Nagra Reels, as you know, a few months ago. I got to about six days before the end of January, before they were all taken down, or those ones that weren't actually able to be uploaded. You know, I know what I heard 
But of course, I was only getting the audio. I didn't get the video. I wasn't there, etc., etc. And that's why, really, these podcasts and discussions continue to exist because we don't know what really happened. Ken McNabb, who's been on the show and who I call a friend now, the line he often quotes to me is, you can't reheat a souffle. And I think, you know, Peter Jackson did say on this video that this is a flavour of what his film is going to be like. So if the film is going to be all smiles for an hour and a half or two hours or however long it is, that's not going to be representative of the truth, in my opinion. However, I've decided that, like I say, I don't really care about the narrative. I mean, people will surely do review shows next year and they can discuss that for as long as they want. That footage looks amazing. I mean, we saw a taste of it in the Beatles anthology, you know, this clear as crystal footage where you can just see every little detail of the room and everything. I always love those shots of the recording studio, looking at the floor and seeing all the cups of tea and, uh, I don't know, fish and chip wrappers and things. <laughs> These are the funny little details I like. But uh, I can't wait to see that footage. And um, that's what I'm going to be focusing on. I mean, apparently we're going to get the whole rooftop performance. Wow. The gift that keeps on giving, as I said on my video appearance debut on the Two Legs podcast the other week. I don't know if you caught that, but uh, I was a little self-conscious watching myself. But I was thinking um, perhaps some of you who've heard my voice for 60 episodes, if you include the bonus ones, might have been curious to see what I looked like on video. I suppose it didn't come out too badly. Anyway, Tom and Andy were very nice to me. I had a good time on that show. So, on to today's show. So this is obviously part two of The Ballad of John and Elvis. The clips you heard there were the Beatles talking about meeting Elvis, and that's one of the things we get to today, the famous summit meeting that turned out to be somewhat anticlimactic, I think. And in between the two clips of that, there was Tom Hanks talking to Stephen Colbert very recently, I think it was about a week ago, talking about Colonel Tom Parker who he's going to be portraying in a movie. I think it's going to be called just Elvis, and I think it's coming out next year. You know, he said, uh, a genius and a scoundrel. I wouldn't say he was a genius. I think, as Ghosty says later on, I think up to a point he managed Elvis very well. But then uh, you probably know where, it, where it's going, really, in the end. Today's part really is more or less focusing on the 60s, the three parts have worked out fairly well. That The first one was 50s, this is 60s, and then the last one is 70s. The things that we cover today, I think we started talking about Elvis's spirituality last week, and we carry on with that. Ghosty shows his encyclopedic knowledge of Elvis's films, and we talk about Colonel Parker, the 1965 meeting with the Beatles, as I've said, and some of the shenanigans involved in that, both before and during. And then we get to the famous... 1968 comeback special and the beginning of the phase of his career that was Las Vegas. So once again, I've given it all away. Don't need to listen anymore. I've told you what we talked about. <laughs> but seriously, there's a lot in today's. There's not much John Lennon, I've got to be honest, but I think of this as just one part of a three-parter, this epic five-hour conversation that Ghosty and I had. There's a lot of Elvis today, but, you know, I think I said in um, the intro to the first episode, I'm sure there's lots of crossover. Beatles fans are interested in Elvis. And what I really got from this conversation that I kind of knew already, but it kind of confirmed it. There's way more to Elvis than a jumpsuit and hound dog and blue suede shoes. You know, there was a great deal more going on. And Ghosty, as I said, he really shows his knowledge today. And I more or less keep up with him. I noticed uh, editing this the last couple of days, there's tons of cultural references. We really... Um, get to expand on the topic that we're ostensibly covering. And of course there are lots of audio clips, as usual. Nice range of them, not all connected to the Beatles and Elvis, but a nice compliment to the conversation we're having. And most importantly, there's lots of laughs as well in today's episode. There's a nice vibe to it. So anyway, I'm going to let you get on with listening, and I'll be back on the other side with a few words. Enjoy. What I wanted to mention here before we move off this topic is sure. that Elvis, unlike the Beatles and Brian Epstein, doesn't this open up a whole new world when we talk about the Colonel oh, in comparison yeah. with Brian Epstein? Of course, but yeah. whatever the Beatles were into, it seems to me that Brian encouraged it. Hmm. When they discovered meditation, wasn't Brian all set to go with them? Yeah, he was. To, yeah. Yes, he was going to join them in Wales. 
the complete opposite happens with Elvis, where you have division in the ranks with the Memphis Mafia, and we haven't really talked about that, but... Don't no worry, it's uh, in my notes. The, it's in, you're right, the Memphis <laughs> Mafia. Elvis surrounded himself <laughs> with a mixture of army buddies, family members, and various guys that were friends of his that would work in some capacity, you know, doing things for him, cleaning his cars or what have you. Some doing more than others. But really, the gist of this is that Elvis never, ever wanted to be alone. And that is a huge, huge problem going forward for Elvis. I mean, he had that early on, but that was a huge, huge problem. Anyway, some of those guys did not take kindly to Larry Geller having such an influence on Elvis. Mm -hmm. Because here Elvis is getting into these books, like Autobiography of a Yogi, and he really has no one to share his enthusiasm with. Priscilla, in her book, Elvis and Me, talks about struggling to understand these books that Elvis is giving her to read. By this time, they were living together. They hadn't got married yet. But he was saying to her, you know, to understand me, you need to understand this. This is where I'm coming from. This is what I'm interested in. Like anybody, you know, if you discover something that you're really excited about, you run and tell your friends. Yeah, I've been there, don't I? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Elvis didn't really have anyone to run to when it came to this stuff. <laughs> mm. Really, it was only Larry Geller. The Beatles, to their credit, would surround themselves with people who seemed to have similar interests. Mm. So those interests that they would have would be cultivated by their friends. And I don't think Elvis had that. I'm not saying mm. these guys were bad. Some of the Memphis Mafia were family members that were wonderful people. Mm. Some, maybe not so much. Can I just clear something up? Sure. The use of the word mafia is that kind of very general use of a group of people, right? Yes. Is there it's, any it's pejorative nothing... about it or, or not? No, no I no, mean, right. I think it was created by the press. I don't think right. that uh, Elvis called, much like the Rat Pack is an invention of the press, exactly. it's certainly not what Sinatra and D. Martin and Sammy Davis called themselves. Right. But Joe Esposito was from Chicago. Elvis mm -hmm. met him when he was in the Army. And I think Elvis liked the idea that Joe Esposito was a kind of guy who was like, yeah, we'll take care of business. Da -da 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 -da. Mm -hmm. And Joe Esposito was running a lot of interference for Elvis with the press. So maybe that's where the press got the idea of the Memphis Mafia. But okay. some of the members of the Memphis Mafia did not take kindly to Larry Geller. Mm -hmm. And they were reporting back to the colonel that this was getting out of hand, that Elvis and his search, by the way, folks, great documentary, Elvis Presley, The Searcher, came out a couple of years ago. Really wonderful. You should check it out. But that search was something that Elvis was becoming preoccupied with. Let's face it. At that time in 1964, Elvis is making movie after movie, soundtrack after soundtrack. These are songs that Elvis has no interest in, really. You know, he's doing his best to try and make something out of it. What is the, mm. the expression about a sow's ear, making a purse from a sow's yeah, ear, right? So, a, yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's kind of what he's doing. And at some point, he stops caring. At some point, he's mm. just showing up and putting his vocal there. So, of course, he's got plenty of time to find other things to interest him. Mm. So some of the members of the Memphis Mafia are ratting him out to the colonel. The colonel puts his foot down and says, this is over. This spirituality stuff, your interest in this, it's affecting your business. And right. this is over. You will not be with Larry Geller anymore. He is no longer your hairdresser. These books, your autobiography of a yogi, your Passover mm. plot, all of these books, we're burning them. Can you imagine that? Can you <laughs> imagine anything like this? It still yeah. boggles my mind when I read about this. Yeah, we're going to give the colonel, um, for better or worse, his own uh, section of this conversation. But uh, I understand his opposition because whatever anyone thinks of him, he certainly was seems like a smart guy. I could see that, you know, Elvis' spirituality might lead him to think, well, all this fame thing's bullshit and I'm being completely manipulated. Yes. You know? But what would the Memphis Mafia's opposition to Larry Geller be? From what I understand, and there's a great book, I think it's called Tales from the Memphis Mafia by Alana Nash. 
Right. And it's an oral history of the Memphis Mafia. But there is a lot of ego at work there. Just like a king in his court, to use that mm. terrible <laughs> analogy, but it's true. Yeah. A lot of vying for position. I'm going to be Elvis Presley's number one guy. I know that he had positions within the Memphis Mafia. The guys who were closest to him were called foremen. So there, there was there was some structure to this. <laughs> it yeah. wasn't all just guys hanging out, you know, with the Hollywood starlets at the house. Years later, you'll hear these guys speak and, you know, they still have issues, ones that survive with other members, you know. Yeah, I mean, they're human beings, you know. I mean, we've, a lot of people have read, uh, what's the famous novel, Lord of the Flies. You know, it's that kind of thing. Yes, yeah, absolutely. We're going to take a tiny little tangent. Elvis made, to my knowledge, 31 films? Yes. Could you very briefly tell me how many of those have you watched and how many are worth watching, in your opinion? <laughs> Go for it. I've seen most of them. Okay. I've probably at one time or another seen all of them. Certainly after he died, they were on television all the time and I watched them. Of his movies when he first started out, the movies from the 50s are all pretty good. Right. Yeah, I like Love Me Tender. He's a supporting player in that. He's not the lead. Loving You is good as a fictionalized version of his own career with a manipulative manager who's a woman. Jailhouse Rock is... Elvis playing up to the idea of him being a menace and a bad boy, even hmm. though he really wasn't. And King Creole is considered his best performance as an actor. I disagree with that. I think that's a good movie, but it's a little too much of Elvis attempting to emulate James Dean for my tastes. I was just going to say, actually, because I, I watched the three James Dean films in one day, I remember, years ago. <sighs> And I remember thinking that he was obviously going in that direction, away from Rebel Without a Cause, towards something else. How many of them would you, would you call dramatic roles? Maybe just one or two? Or? No, he, in the 60s, he did a few of them. Wild in the Country is a dramatic oh, role, right, and right. Flaming Star, and then later on Charo. But the truth of the matter is, what he called the travelogues, Blue yeah. Hawaii, Fun in Acapulco, where Elvis is on vacation somewhere with beautiful women singing 12 songs. Those movies far outgrossed the serious films. Well, that's no so, surprise, unfortunately, yeah. is it? I mean, the right. most popular and, yeah. film is generally trashy even today, isn't it? Right. So yeah. that became the modus operandi. A colonel would say to Elvis, there's no point doing a movie like Wild in the Country because no one went to see it. Exactly. We're not making any money off this. Well, he would put it in the sense, this is what your fans want. Do mm. you want to disappoint your fans, the people that made you who you are? Yeah. They don't want to see you doing a, a serious role. They want to see you with Anne Margaret mm. in Vegas. So those are the kinds of movies that you should be doing. And those contracts were drawn up. Elvis had to make a certain amount a year. And that was so much work that there really was no time to record songs that Elvis really enjoyed. There were at least two years where he only did movie songs. That was it. Yeah. But of those films, Follow That Dream is a very good film in a Beverly Hillbillies kind of tradition. <laughs> and Elvis right. plays comedy, and he's very, very good at it. Viva Las Vegas is a good film. It's the closest to a, a big Hollywood musical and, and yeah. Blue Hawaii to some degree. And Anne Margaret has a ton of charisma. So you have both of them in that movie that makes that special. Then later on, I would say the last dramatic film he did, Change of Habit, where he plays a hip doctor in the slums. It was an attempt to make a sort of socially relevant Elvis film. Mm. So, you know, Elvis is the doctor by day, guitar player by night, who is helping people in the ghetto. <laughs> and Mary mm -hmm. Tyler Moore is one of three nuns who are going undercover. I mean, this is what a plot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the end of the movie, getting back to the spiritual, this is we can wrap it up in a bow here, talking about the spirituality. Okay. Elvis Presley's, the name of his character in the film is John Carpenter. Initials J.C. Oh, I see. Of course, right. right? The end of the film, it takes place in a church. Elvis is on stage singing a kind of rock and roll gospel song. Mary Tyler Moore has just confessed to him that she's secretly been a nun this whole time. That's why she couldn't have a relationship. 
So she's standing in the church. Elvis is at the pulpit, rocking and rolling. And she is looking at the cross and then looking at Elvis, looking at the cross then looking at Elvis. And that's how the movie ends, where we don't see what her decision is. Is she going to go back to the convent? (laughs) Or is she going to stay rocking and rolling in the ghetto with Elvis? I think it's actually kind of a very bold move. Maybe it's artistically misguided, but it's a bold move to show someone having to choose between Christ and Elvis at the end of a movie. <laughs> That's pretty unusual. And it does have socially relevant songs like Change of Habit. The title song is about being inclusive. and It's an interesting film from that standpoint. I mean, from what I've seen, I feel like if things had been different, if he'd had a different manager and he'd been, he'd been able to have like a regular film career, I think he was well capable. Because I think he probably liked movies as well. Like the idea of it. It's just... Again, I haven't seen it all. I haven't heard all the songs, but it seemed just so production line by the end. I mean, it was just industrial uh, film. It's absolutely. And, and so, you know? Yeah, I would say by 1963, it had become that. Okay. And remember, he kept making movies up through 1969. So mm. it had really become the assembly line. Here are the songs. You have to sing a song to a dog in this scene. Mm. You have to sing a song about working on a boat. So here's Song of the Shrimp. And then the Colonel has a deal to release these soundtrack albums as albums to fulfill his contract with RCA. So the Colonel has very cleverly designed this so that the movies benefit the albums, the albums benefit the films, not taking into consideration that maybe Elvis would want to do something else. Mm. He was allowed to do gospel material. If you want to hear Elvis committed to great performances his gospel work of the early 60s and into the mid 60s is pretty spectacular yeah i couldn't agree more i mean i think along with the rock and roll when he was really feeling the rock and roll which uh, we're going to get to the 68 special it's something you can't quite put your finger on but it's something from the depths of this guy's soul you know yes he's absolutely feeling it you know yeah he's totally feeling it you Mm -hmm. know his version of how great thou art even the songs from his hand in mind that were old spiritual. Some of them are country songs, but that music is so much a part of him that his soul really comes out to play when he's doing those songs. I know a lot of people don't like to listen to it because it is gospel music and they think Mm. it's going to be boring, but it's not, you know, it's really wonderful stuff. Yeah. Any musician will tell you there's a sweet spot and it's, it's hard to sort of manufacture it. I'm sure Elvis had it a bit in Vegas there's a moment where you just transcend. Right. I think it often happens with songs you've written yourself, but as I was saying earlier, Elvis had this magic ability to just completely own these songs, whether or not he'd written them. But there's right. a moment that is just better than any drug you could take, you know, and it's just to do with, I don't know, it's your soul, you know, that's spiritual, you know, because spiritual really, I mean, in our culture, you watch comedy shows where they're, mercilessly mocking spiritual people but it really just means your own truth doesn't it right well that's what it comes down to i'll give you an example of a performance where elvis does that elvis recorded a version of bridge over troubled waters Hmm. now everybody and their brother-in-law has recorded that song (laughs) i mean there are so many versions it's a cliche at this point Hmm. why would anybody cover it you know the original sung by Art Garfunkel is is great as a recording. It's a great performance. And, and if you hear it and you think to yourself, oh, God, Elvis doing Bridge Over Troubled Water. And he did this in 1970. His version is fantastic because he's feeling it in a way that these other artists are not feeling it. That song, for whatever reason, really connects to him. And he blows the roof off the church. It's not a bombastic performance. There's a version of it that's on Essential Elvis. It's, it's an undubbed master. Because th- that was later on, Elvis had this producer, Elton Jarvis, who would slather Elvis recordings with a lot of orchestra and choirs. But I like Spectre did with Let It Be, perhaps. Absolutely. Yeah. And when you hear these recordings without all of these overdubs, and sometimes Elvis had no say at all in these overdubs, It's like listening to the song for the first time. You think to yourself, well, I've missed this because it was buried underneath all this sludge. (laughs) There's a really great performance here and a really heartfelt performance, 
but it's just been covered up. There's a guy called Howard Goodall who's made some great uh, – God, listeners are going to love this. They're going to spend the rest of their life uh, right, right, getting around you know, to all these references, aren't they? He did a very good demonstration of hmm. why Bridge Over Trouble Water is one of the best pop or rock compositions ever because it's got a little bit of blues in there. It's got a little bit of gospel in there. So I could totally right. understand that. I mean, Elvis did a great version of Get Back as well. Yeah, really rocking. Yeah. There's a version of Hey Jude that Elvis did, which never should have been released. It was just a rehearsal. But at that time in the 70s, they couldn't get Elvis to record enough material to fill up an album. So they would go and look for outtakes and, you know, just one-off rehearsals and jams and throw them onto the records to fill up the space. And unfortunately, oh, yeah. that hurt Elvis Presley's recording reputation. Because if you hear his version of Hey Jude and not know the backstory, you would just think, oh, what is this guy doing? You know, he's, <laughs> he doesn't know the words to this song and he's half-hearted, you know, it's, it's awful. But yeah. there's so much mishandling of Elvis Presley's career. It's, it'd make your head spin. His best work is so good that it managed to rise above all the complete mismanagement and horrible decisions <laughs> that were made on his behalf. Yeah. I mean, it happened a bit with Jimmy as well after he died because his yeah, father, oh, got, God, father yes. got control and it was like, Oh, here's an album of Jimi Hendrix on the toilet strumming a guitar. You know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Okay. So we're getting up to the, the famous summit of 1965, but just before that in the, in this book, I've been reading this Elvis meets the Beatles book. I think the Colonel met Brian in 64. I think Elvis actually talked to Paul McCartney on the phone just prior to right. the meeting. And there was a bit of toing and froing and one-upmanship and about the venue, wasn't it, mainly? And as far as I can see, it seems fair enough that they would go see Elvis because he was there first. He was the one that inspired them. But um, this is probably an opportune moment to talk about uh, Colonel Parker. Mm. Now, you know, uh, we could do about four hours on that, but... Uh, my memories of the Goralnik book are that Colonel Parker got a fairly, quite a fair shake. But I think the popular perception, I mean, we know that he was Dutch. I'm going to give you the floor in two seconds. I'm just going to say that obviously one of the reasons that Elvis didn't tour abroad was that the Colonel was worried that he wouldn't get back in the country. So he had this sort of mysterious past. Yes. He had a terrible gambling habit, which again, I'll ask you about in a sec. And the popular opinion, of course, is that Basically, he put Elvis on this horrible schedule, and there's a quote from the 70s of, like, he has to be on tour. You know, the number one thing is that he has to be on stage. So could you tell us from your um, experience, what's your perception of Colonel Parker? Well, I think Colonel Parker was no pressure, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Uh, all right, well, we'll tackle the rumors first. Okay. That he may have been were allegedly involved in either a murder in Europe. That always seems to be a very mysterious subject. And I'm always tiptoeing around that because we really don't know the facts. It's shrouded in mystery. I know there are books, Elvis and the Colonel, and hmm. all about Colonel Tom Parker. And there's plenty of stuff after that, after he comes to the U.S. And by the way, the Colonel title is honorary. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've got <laughs> but, his real name uh, here somewhere. But. Yeah, it's, it's like Andreas Krulik or something. Van Gogh or something, yeah. Yeah, I, I think he was great for Elvis Presley's early career. He was moving into uncharted territory since there really weren't any flaming supernovas in rock music and rock music had just really kicked off. Yeah. And I think he managed his career beautifully early on. Mm -hmm. I don't think you could really ask for better high profile television performances, a movie contract. Elvis is recording songs that he wants to record and he's more or less directing the session. You had Chet Atkins there producing, but Elvis is more or less the studio producer on the floor, I guess the line producer. But when Elvis returns from the army and, and the Colonel orchestrated that as well, you know, the army did offer Elvis a chance to just be a performer and do quote unquote goodwill for the army. And the Colonel was thinking, Oh no, it's going to play into Elvis Presley's favor because at the time he was hated by everybody, <laughs> the segregationists, 
religious leaders and parents and this was going to really show that he was a normal decent boy by going in and serving his time for two years but once the 60s started that whole rock world changed and i don't think the colonel really had any clue how to deal with that or nor did i think he had any interest in it because he's always credited as being such a shrewd businessman but when you see what's happening in music, especially from the arrival of the Beatles onward, you would think any other manager would pull Elvis out of those movies and say, take a look at Dusty Springfield and the Dusty in Memphis album. You should do a high profile record like that. That came later, but it almost came a little too late for Elvis. But the Colonel, as someone who oversaw a career in the 1960s, I would give him very poor marks. I'd right. give him a, you know, an A or a B plus in the 1950s, but boy, he really, there's an expression here. I'll just use it. He shit the bed. You know that expression. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I know. <laughs> and then when we get into the seventies, then it's a whole other story. Then it becomes very dark and it's baffling. And you have the Colonel and Elvis renegotiating their contracts so that the Colonel receives 50% of his earnings. Mm -hmm. which is unheard of for a manager to take that much money. And I know yeah. the Presley estate later sued, posthumously sued the Colonel. There's records coming out and there's no quality control in the seventies, mm -hmm. slapping a photo of just Elvis in concert on the front. They all look like live albums, but most of them aren't. Yeah. And they're filled with outtakes and Elvis is, there's been no real diagnosis, but it's my feeling that Elvis was depressed throughout most of the 70s. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. I want to ask you later where you think the sort of decline happened, because I've kind of pinned it to a year, but you, you may know better than me. You're but, probably um, right. As a manager, pull that guy off the road. This is mm. a guy that should not be performing to that degree, giving so many concerts, two or three a night, especially yeah. in that shape. And that last concert, which I'm sure we'll get to, the one, Ooh. I mean, I, it wasn't the last concert, but it was the last television special. Yeah. That television special should not have even been on the cards. Is that June that 77, should, the one with Unchained Melody? That's right. Elvis in concert, the CBS yeah. special. We'll get, that we'll get, aired, yeah. It aired after he died. Any manager, you would think, would see Elvis in that condition Hmm. and think, I don't want my client going out looking like that. Yeah. This is interesting because I did a Bob Dylan show with a Bob Dylan podcaster. I had a, a therapist on, and we we touched on John Lennon and also Emmy Winehouse, and we talked about Michael Jackson. There's a parallel there because Dylan's motorbike accident is thought by many people to have either not happened or I think was probably exaggerated. I agree, I agree. Yeah, yeah. because Dylan, I don't know the stats off, off the top of my head, but Dylan, he had a tour planned or Grossman had, had planned a tour. By the way, I think a few people think that Albert Grossman wrote that book about John Lennon, but that was Albert Goldman anyway. <laughs> That's a whole other thing. No, I, I keep hearing people on uh, in interviews mentioning, or maybe they just got the name wrong, but what I was saying was that Grossman had, set up a tour with Dylan of something crazy like 40 gigs in 42 days, something like that. Michael Jackson was due to go on another exhausting tour. Amy Winehouse was booked to go on a tour. So I don't, I don't think there's any coincidence going on here. Mm. And but, I uh, guess Albert Grossman is sort of the figure that's in between Brian Epstein and Colonel Parker. Who right, had degrees. Yeah. Sort of 50% <laughs> evil. And, uh, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. But, so um, can I, now can I give the rebuttal to uh, absolutely. what I just said about the colonel? Go for it. Okay, I'll mention this, and I'm not saying I buy into this, okay. but there have been recently some people who have come forward on various Elvis-related podcasts. One of them I'll mention it's the Jungle Room podcast oh, yeah. hosted by Jamie Kay. And there was someone who, and I, I wish I had the information here, but it's someone who worked with the colonel Maybe he was a booking agent, and he gave a different version of that story. He said that the reason that Elvis never toured overseas was not because the colonel was afraid that he would go overseas with Elvis and not be allowed to return to the States, that he would yep. find himself extradited there. It was because the colonel knew that Elvis 
could not perform overseas because of the amount of drugs that he would take with him. There was no way the pharmaceuticals <laughs> that Elvis would need in order to perform or to at least appear stable. Mm. There is no way that Elvis could go from country to country to country hauling all of that stuff. Or he'd and have that, to find a dealer, which is what Keith Richards said in his book. Right. Everywhere they went on tour, he'd have to be like, oh, shit, I've got three hours before the gig. I've got to find some heroin, you know. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I know so there's, Sorry. So oh. there's that theory as well, which paints the colonel in maybe a, a more sympathetic light. I just want mm. to be fair here mm. because it's very easy, and I'm, I'm doing it too, of denigrating the colonel or portraying him in a negative light. So I just want to say that there is a counter argument to that out there, and yeah. your mileage may vary. Yeah, I mean, I think the word is monster, really. People think of him as a sort of monster with no heart, don't they? But, uh, you know, he was a human being. Yeah, an unusual one, considering <laughs> uh, the interviews I've had. I, Steve Bender talks yeah. about the colonel indoctrinating him into his snowman's club, basically a bullshit artist club, and the colonel fighting with him over the direction of the 68 comeback special. And Steve Bender, who was closer to the situation than anyone else that I know lays a lot of the blame at the Colonel's feet. So I do take into account the people who were there and knew the Colonel and the Colonel does have a lot to answer for. Yeah. I mean, I've just got a few things here for my notes. I mean, just a few notes on his kind of backstory. Fifth of nine children left Holland to avoid military service, sold hot dogs in the carnival Enlisted in the U.S. Army, discharged with a back injury, worked as a dog catcher at the Humane Society of Tampa. It's interesting. Then he started managing a singer called Eddie Arnold, country western singer. Oh, yes. yes. And then saw Elvis performing in 54. It's a famous quote, which is sort of darkly comical. Someone said there's a rumor that Elvis pays you 50% of his earnings, and he said, bullshit, I pay him 50%. It kind of shows that he's got a sense of humor, even if it's a horrible one. Going back to what you were just saying, I think things get simplified. And I think you've got to remember, as you were saying earlier, about he was dealing with an unprecedented situation, much as Brian Epstein was a few years later, or almost around the same time, actually. Now, I guess the thing I'd really like to ask you about is that I think a lot of this thing about getting Elvis on tour was because the colonel apparently had a monster gambling habit. And I've yes. heard stories, tell me if this is true or not, he could have even lost them up to a million a night. I mean, maybe that's a bit fanciful, but any ideas about? Yes, I've, I've read that too. In fact, there was a book that came out, I want to say it was last year, called Elvis in Vegas right. by Richard Zoglin, and he documents that. The colonel had a gambling problem, and he needed cash, and that may have played a part in some of the horrible negotiating that yeah. the colonel did on Elvis Presley's behalf with RCA Records. At one point, the colonel gave away, basically, because he sold it off for a song, mm. the rights to those early recordings to RCA. Boy, I wish I had the information here. It's either it's the publishing company, it was Gladys Music or Hill and Range or whatever the situation was. Right. Up to a certain point, RCA had license to do what they wanted to do with those recordings. He orchestrated a deal where very valuable recordings like Hound Dog and Don't Be Cruel and all the early hits, they were getting very little money from after a time in the 70s. This wasn't entirely unusual. The Beach Boys had a similar situation where their father, Murray Wilson, sold off Sea of Tunes. That was the publishing company for all the Brian Wilson 60s hits, sold them to Capitol for next to nothing. I think $50,000, thinking that that music had run its course and there was no financial incentive to hold on to those rights. Probably the same thing with the colonel, but he, he was more motivated by gambling. I guess I can say to the colonel's credit, I haven't read anything about the colonel being involved with the mob, which you would think would be the natural yeah. way of things in Las Vegas. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Too, he was too crafty even for the mafia. I suppose if he did have an extreme gambling habit, that would almost humanize him a bit because that would mean that there was actually the more valid reason for putting you know, a sick Elvis on tour. Right. At least there's a reason. So it's not that he was being greedy, it's that he was desperate. But you know, maybe he was greedy as well, who knows. But 
I mean, just to say, you know, that again, it's not unprecedented in rock music. I mean, this is a, I'm not involved in it, but I know it's a rough business, you know? And the, the other thing I remember from the Goralnik book is that just after Elvis died, we'll probably get to this later, but the Colonel got a lot of flack. Maybe he didn't go to the funeral or something, or he started talking about business and funny parallel. Cause Yoko Ono was kind of the same. Almost mm. as soon as John Lennon was shot the next day, she was meeting with, um, what's his name? Geffen to talk about releases. But, I think there's a quote from Goralnik that the colonel said to somebody, listen, you know, we've got to get in there quick because the vultures are on their way, you know? He also famously said, nothing has changed. This is just like when he went into the army. Oh, interesting, yeah. So, I mean, this idea that, yes, you know, you, you want to grieve for somebody, but if you're involved in this kind of absolute cutthroat business, it's like politics, you know. I've been working my way through the show Veep this year, Fantastic. And it's actually based on a, a British show called The Thick of It, that both of which are written by Armando Onucci. And I don't know how much you've seen of Veep. I'm sure some of the listeners have seen it, but I'm on the last series. And the character that Julia Louis-Dreyfus plays is just becoming more and more despicable. Because <laughs> it's in a comedy show, we can kind of laugh a bit. She's just doing some horrendous things. And I suppose the message of it is that, you know, if you're in politics, you're in a dirty business. And without knowing anything about what it's actually like to be in in the business of elvis or the business of the beatles or the business of politics it's slightly hard to judge i think pete townsend had a quote and i'm going to paraphrase it because i don't remember it exactly but he said rock music is a powerful light and it shines really bright but when you look closer you find out that what's causing that flame to burn so bright are piles of bodies. Right. That's very interesting. He is very quote worthy, wasn't he, Pete Townsend? Yes. Yeah. Sure he still is. Yeah. I mean, there's other sort of power. I mean, if you ever seen the movie Trading Places, and we're really going on tangents, but right. uh, if you remember, you know, Dan, Dan Aykroyd's the corporate businessman, Eddie Murphy's the, I think he's a veteran, isn't he, or something? But, um, I'm not sure. It's been anyway, a long time. but uh, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, in the end, they get together, obviously, to try and uh, bankrupt these Duke brothers. And uh, just before they go into Wall Street, Dan Aykroyd says something to Eddie Murphy. I don't remember. It's something like, if you think it's rough on the streets, wait till you get in here, my friend. You know? Yeah. <laughs> the idea that in a you know, respectable business, you've got all the snakes in suits, as they call them. You know, The fact mm. that just because these aren't street people that they can't be like just as rough in a sort of exactly respectable way, you know? And also, um, I don't know if you heard of the author, Robert Greene, his most famous books, the 48 laws of power. And he sort of writes books about how to negotiate life along the lines of how to win friends and influence people. And he, right. he did a book with 50 cent and 50 cent, an incredible story of street life. And again, right. Green found parallels and 50 cent when he went in the music business, he said, Jesus, I thought, you know, street life was bad. <laughs> These people are like a hundred <laughs> times more immoral, you know, <laughs> right, right. very interesting. Yeah. Anyway, let's finally get to the meeting. Oh, actually, agree. Can I jump in for one second? Please. Yes. Go on. This probably would be an insert, probably worth mentioning as silly as it is. There is in all of the Elvis literature out there, this sense, and in actual fact, interviews with the Memphis Mafia and other people have well, have well uh, talked about it. The idea that Elvis felt intimidated by the colonel, right. or he felt that his entire success and his entire career was the result of the colonel's doing. I don't know if that's something that the colonel kept reinforcing to Elvis, but Elvis seemed afraid of the colonel, at least to me. The colonel was obviously an authority figure to Elvis, and sometimes a kindly uncle figure, but sometimes he could lay the law down, as we discussed with getting rid of Larry Geller and quashing Elvis's interest in spirituality and that sort of thing. Now, Phil Spector, and take this with a grain of salt, claims that he witnessed the colonel hypnotizing Elvis. Wow. And he's mentioned this several times. Take that for what it is, folks, but it's <laughs> another little Beatle connection in a way. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps we could just briefly talk about, I guess, the perception of Brian Epstein. Epstein, Jesus. I keep getting in trouble because <laughs> the, the English pronunciation is Epstein, and I always find myself saying Epstein. Well, there was a debate about that on another Beatles podcast. Is that the one where they and, played about six clips of 
Yes. <laughs> Saying Epstein, yeah, yeah. Right. I think they said that the actual pronunciation originally for the family was Epstein, and then they changed it to Epstein. So the family changed the name, the pronunciation. Well, there's yes. a clip on um, the Maisel's Brothers film where you get his secretary going, Yes, the manager's name is Brian Epstein. And then the American lady on the phone here saying, Brian Epstein? <laughs> Brian Epstein. <laughs> but it's true. Well, Gosh. may we have his name, please? The manager's name is Mr. Brian Epstein. Brian Epstein. You know, we, we had uh, the television program Welcome Back Cotter in the mm. 70s. Very popular. There was a character on that show named Epstein. So it's just we're accustomed to the name being pronounced Epstein. Epstein. Took some getting used to. There's your tangent for the day. <laughs> yeah, well, here's, here's another one. If you want to talk about crazy coincidences, how about this? In 69, when the Beatles are having their sort of acrimonious meetings, Klein was on the Lennon side and the Eastmans were on um, the McCartney side. Of course, Klein found out that the Eastmans' original name was Epstein. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, another I mean, people. honestly, there must be someone, there must be a god up there. Making all this, I was, you know, I was waiting for you to say that we found out that Klein's original pronunciation was clean, <laughs> Mr. Clean. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Where were we? I've completely lost. Anyway, <laughs> I think we're, we're getting talk- up to the the meeting. We're getting. Yeah, there. yeah. Well, all I was going to say was that uh, again, a tiny thing in the Colonel's defense actually is that I'm not sure how interested Elvis would have been in the business. If we can bring it to John Lennon for a sec. I mean, we hear stories about. John, apparently this sort of famous Spanish holiday in 63 was to let Epstein know that, you know, I'm the guy you need to, to deal with. And we could probably guess that Paul was quite interested in the business side. George is kind of known as a money beetle, but that may be just on the strength of that one song. But um, there could be a case for saying that the artists, particularly as they get wilder and wilder and Elvis got more and more, well, under the influence of drugs, but perhaps they didn't really want to take care of the business. So... Well, yeah, he didn't have anyone around him that he trusted who would know anything about it. He had his father take care of some of his personal finances. Mm -hmm. This is the same man who went to prison for forging a check. So that really wasn't in good hands. Oh, I want one other thing. One (laughs) other thing. This is not in the colonel's defense. It's funny you mentioned that he was working for the Humane Society at one point. Are you going to start telling me he was had a job strangling chickens or something? Oh, no. That Very wild, close. That was a wild, oh, shit. That was a guess. <laughs> Very <laughs> close because he was a carny. So oh, yeah. he worked carnivals. One of his great innovations was the dancing chicken. Tell the audience about that. Yeah, that's, uh, it's horrendous but interesting. So you would pay your money, <laughs> 10 cents, to oh. see a dancing chicken. There would be a stage that the chicken would be on, and the chicken would start dancing because, unknown to the audience, unseen by the audience, there was a, a hot plate yeah. oh, under, the, uh, under the little mini stage. And that's why the chicken was hopping up and down. He wasn't <sighs> doing it for your amusement. Now, there are all sorts of parallels you can make with how he managed Elvis Presley's career, but that is also something that uh, the colonel pioneered and yeah. i can tell you that as recent as the 1970s i saw that in action i went to a carnival where they had that attraction as a child and i of course as a kid i thought it was wonderful this chicken was dancing not knowing what was causing that to happen Ugh. it's awful it's, it's so it's, awful it's almost an interesting sort of analogy isn't it for the whole thing that you just yeah. see what's on the surface and you don't know what dark right. shit's going on underneath. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you think you have to be something of a sadist to dream oh. up that idea, wouldn't you? Oh, God. <laughs> All right. So Friday, 27th of August, 1965. We do know that for sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm going to give you the sort of Chris Hutchins, who was a journalist who was there, potted version. So here goes. So the Beatles arrive about 10 o'clock. In the Beatles anthology, they talk about Priscilla kind of being brought out apparently wearing gingham and a gingham bow and everything. But according to this book, Priscilla was actually already there. Elvis was getting a little bit podgy, but still looking pretty good. And the story goes that this kind of sat around for a while and there's a sort of silence. And then Elvis said something like, well, you know, if you're not going to talk, I'm going to go to bed or something. And then some, some guitars are brought out. And in this book, they came up with this brilliant name. They said, Sergeant Presley's Lonesome Heartbreak Band. (laughs) <laughs> so, isn't that a fantastic name that's great 
another book, this may have even been Goldman, has the Beatles sitting sort of two either side of Elvis, almost like a backing band, which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> and apparently they jammed Scylla Black's You're My World, so the, the other Scylla. This book sure. also said they may have jammed I Feel Fine, but I'm not convinced with that. And it seems that Elvis was playing a bit of bass and Paul was giving him some tips. So I don't know. What do we know for sure of, of that night? Maybe. Well, interestingly, there are photos of the Beatles leaving. So That's we do have now. some documentation. Mm. And you see Elvis at the door, and I believe you see Priscilla there. So that does prove that she was around. And for the benefit of the audience, Priscilla at that time was living in sin with Elvis. They had yet That's to right. be married, right? Yes, uh, yeah, they wouldn't be married right. until 1967, That's right? right. You know, he met Priscilla in, in Germany. She was 14 at the time. Then two years later, when she was 16, she came to visit. Then when she was 17, she moved in. So that's the timeline there. Yeah, what I know about that meeting is pretty much what everyone has said, uh, the Beatles being the least reliable accounts, <laughs> because they all seem to differ about what happened. John said they all jammed. Paul said they didn't jam or that he just played bass with them. Chris Hutchins, has a, who was also there, has a different story. When that happens, I kind of think that the meeting itself must have been uneventful and that everyone has sort of created their own version of that meeting to make it a little more lively. I know that when the Beatles were going there, that was right in the middle or right at the tail end of that very tense time where Elvis was a little removed from his Memphis Mafia guys because some of them had complained to the colonel about the influence of Larry Gaylor and Elvis's interest in spirituality. So Elvis was not in the best of moods with his own guys who were living with him. And he was also feeling pushed to the side by the success of the Beatles. He had said to Jerry Schilling that he was embarrassed to meet them because Elvis was well aware that he was making movies like Kiss and Cousins and the Beatles were making hit records. Yeah, but help isn't, in some ways, <laughs> isn't that much more impressive. I kind of got an affection for the help film, but uh, as a piece of art, I don't, I don't think it's sort of high art. It's not, it's not in the same echelon hmm. as A Hard Day's Night. I do like help. I seem to like it more as the years go on, but it's very much of that same ilk where you sort of load it because Elvis movies would be like that too. You mm -hmm. know, it's Elvis and look, here's Barbara Stanwyck showing up. <laughs> what is she doing in the movie? So it was sort of a tense situation that the Beatles were walking into there. And the whole meeting itself seems like a very showbiz affair. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know what the purpose of the meeting would be Were the Beatles hoping that they would, connect with Elvis and they would become pals. I don't mm. know why it happened other than they're both really big names. So therefore it should happen. Yeah. Get the big names together. See, who has got the biggest ego. <laughs> I mean, Elvis probably could have handled that better from what I understand. He has that famous line where they, you know, they all come in, they're stoned anyway, according to George Harrison, they were oh, stoned yeah. on the way and forgot that they were even going to Elvis. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Came out the, the limo sort of giggling like a Beatles right. cartoon. Yeah, yeah. And they go, oh yes, we're going to see Elvis. <laughs> and they get there and they just stare at him. And we had talked about that before, how sometimes when you're in the presence of someone famous, even if you are famous, you're mm. still gawking because mm that's a person you've idolized for so long. So basically they looked at him for a period of time. And then Elvis said, well, if you fellows are, I'll, I'll go for real here. I'm going to go for broke. Okay. okay. Here we go. <laughs> well, listen, if you fellows just going to stand there and stare at me, I might as well go to bed. I mean, I'm pushing. sorry, Elvis. <laughs> We're just a bit stoned Elvis. I don't know which one of the Beatles that is. That's a mixture of the four. <laughs> yeah. When you do George, you um, got to, you got this also low. No, that's not. Uh, we I, had something in the car before we yeah. came. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not Scouse, by the way. You know, I've, I've talked to people from Liverpool. I mean, it is Scouse, but it, it, it's a Beatle accent. It's not really discernible as Scouse. It's the Beatles. <laughs> and in Mike McCartney's book, <laughs> yeah, he says that early on, they really exaggerated it. Aunt Mimi was very unimpressed when she heard. You Paul's like father, from, too. Yeah, she said to him, so you sound like you're from Bootle or something. Bootle's right, a poor, right. poor area in the north of Liverpool. It's got that very guttural, <laughs> all right, all right, oh, it's great, that kind of guttural <laughs> scouse, yeah. <laughs> but, back to, but back to the meeting, from what I gathered, 
yes, Elvis was playing the bass. Well, I've heard Paul tell the story that he was impressed that Elvis had one of the first remote control devices so he could change channels, which they were all amazed that technology existed. Yeah. And someone said, you know, oh, Elvis is playing bass. Well, I'm your boy. Mm. And he goes over there and Elvis did play bass. Uh, he plays bass on um, You're So Square, Baby, I Don't Care. He seems to have made himself somewhat absent after that because most of the memories that I read about are with the other Beatles and the Memphis Mafia. Didn't mm. Ringo play pool? Yeah, that's what I've got here. Ringo played pool. I think Brian Epps. Oh, God. Brian Epstein. <laughs> oh, this is terrible. Don't watch what I say now. Brian Epstein and uh, the Colonel slash the Memphis Mafia. I'm not sure who. They went on to the, the roulette table or whatever was set up and had, had some cocktails or whiskey or whatever. Right. So they kind of, it seems like they all sort of peeled off at some point. George said he was trying to find out if anyone had any more weed. Right. And they was outside smoking with some of the guys. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. That's what so, I'd heard, yeah. I guess the thing we could probably all agree on is that it was a, a bit of a non-event. But um, what about this stuff about John affecting a, an Inspector Clouseau accent, an exaggerated French accent? Do we know if that's... He might have done that for Elvis's benefit because Elvis was a Peter Sellers fanatic. Ah, I don't think it was done to insult him. I think it was done to make Elvis laugh because Elvis, I think at that time, his favorite movie was uh, Dr. Strangelove. It's one of my favorites as well. Yeah. Yes. Love, love it. Yeah, because this, this book, this is where a bit of conjecture comes in. John Lennon, from my notes, saw a covered wagon emblazoned with All the Way with LBJ. This is a famous slogan. Apparently made a veiled reference to Vietnam, and this book makes out that, that started the sort of John versus Elvis war, which yeah, I don't totally buy. And then uh, John Lennon's parting shot was apparently, you know, thanks for the music, long live the king. Right. This book really makes out as if it's just full of disdain. And, uh, you know, it could have been. Well, I've noticed this with that particular meeting that Elvis fans and Beatle fans each come to that meeting with their own agenda. Mm. Sometimes Beatle fans... And I don't know why. I mean, if you're a fan of the Beatles, that's a pretty good thing to be a fan of, that you really wouldn't have to try to diminish someone else. But I think some Beatles fans, not all, but some Beatles fans relish the idea that not much happened at that meeting and right. really like to play up the idea that the Beatles were too cool for school and really stuck it to Elvis at the end, you know, with yeah. John's comment. Yeah, he was really showing Elvis. Uh, and I don't think it was like that at all. I think despite what Lennon might have said on television on uh, Jukebox Jury about oh, yeah. Kiss Me Quick or what they all might have said about, oh, he was, he was great, but he's not great anymore. I think they were too respectful, even John, to insult Elvis to his face. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and it, I mean, you'd think like if, if they'd got stoned, they would have been a bit more mellow, you know. I mean, you know, if, if John Lennon got drunk, then... Uh, Joking aside, I, think, I mean, there could have been fireworks because he was a terrible drunk. I think. Yes, agree. it's true. We can all agree about the, the cotex could have been on Elvis's head. Well, I was thinking, well, yeah, I, I'm not saying he would have done this, but, you know, the Bob Willer incident gets darker with every telling, but, yeah, not to say in a million years that he would have done that to Elvis, but you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it's surprising that nobody's made a film about that. You know, they've made yeah. two Elvis meets Nixon films, but you could have a field day with Elvis meets the Beatles. I'm, or actually, I am surprised that no one's made a movie about that. I do know that Lennon said to Pete Shotton afterwards, much later, that it was a drag and Elvis was a boring old fart. But I know that the next night, the Memphis Mafia went to visit the Beatles. Elvis mm. was invited, but Elvis didn't go. The next night, they said, why don't you come and see us? And Elvis, said, oh, you know, I, I, I get up early, uh, whatever. And but yeah. the other, the Memphis Mafia guys were like, "Yeah, we'll go. Yeah, come on, yeah, sure." Mm. And so they all went to the Beatles, who were renting a house. Yeah, right. It wasn't a hotel, I don't think. Well, that would have been too tough for them. So they were renting a house, and the Memphis Mafia came, and then John Lennon said to maybe Marty Lacker, or one of those guys, mm. that meeting Elvis was the highlight of his life. It's not unusual for John, or let's be honest, anybody to change their opinion or to tell people what they want to hear. I thought you were doing a pun there. With it. It's not unusual. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Tom Jones is now with Priscilla, isn't he, apparently? Is that right? I, you know, I've heard, in a relationship or not? I've heard <laughs> Priscilla's with Jerry Schilling now. I've heard <laughs> Priscilla's with Tom Jones. Uh, I'm not sure. Priscilla's but, with me. 
<laughs> She's mine. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, Elvis might have said that on the night. That's probably why he might have been worried <laughs> that uh, the Beatles would have taken a look at her with all that mascara and the beehive hairdo and lost yeah. their minds. Yeah. <laughs> I like. I do like the image of Priscilla being wheeled out, you know, looking like a princess, and then wheeled back into the catacombs somewhere. So they got to look at her, and that was about it. I, I well, doubt that, that happened, but... I've got a feeling that this book, I mean, I read it a couple of weeks ago now. I think it has John giving her the eye or something. That, that's why I'm pretty skeptical about that passage of the book, even though it's a very good book. I definitely would recommend it. So we're kind of going a little bit chronologically. I was interested in this part. We'll talk about the drugs sort of in the 70s later on, but in 1966, apparently Elvis did LSD. You know, again, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the story I heard, and then... Tell me if this is true. So I've got here, Elvis dropped acid with Priscilla, Larry Geller, and Jerry Schilling on Boxing Day, December 26, 1966. And some great quotes from Priscilla here. The veins in the grass became visible, breathing slowly and rhythmically. We went from tree to tree, observing nature in detail. And then Jerry said, I stared at Elvis, and he seemed to morph into a child. He was this plump little boy, at times insecure. The more I stared, the more he changed. Eventually, I saw him as a baby smiling back at me, contented as could be. Now, I'm just going to be honest and say that I did have a, an LSD phase and mushrooms, etc. when I was younger. I haven't done it for years and years and years, but I do remember the trees breathing. That's one thing. When we just did the drug show recently, Tom Anyadi and I, we talked about how some people take drugs to get wasted. Some people take drugs for spiritual enlightenment. Some people take drugs for energy reasons yeah, there's all kinds of reasons for taking them but i think with lsd i mean it certainly has the potential to open portals i mean george was talking about lsd pretty much on his deathbed right so yeah very interesting do we know like how many times he did it or you know was he into other was he into marijuana for example i know that elvis did try marijuana but didn't get mm. much from it right and i think he dropped acid for the same reason that he was reading all of these various books that Larry Geller was right. giving him. We talked earlier about Elvis trying to fill that void. Mm -hmm. And I think he was hoping that this would do it for him. As far as I know, and I think Priscilla talks about it in her book, they did it maybe a few more times and then that was it. I mean, and Elvis cool. went back to pills. If you take Proper LSD, proper strength LSD. I mean, it's not really a sustainable thing. That's why John Lennon was in such a mess. If you look at the Sergeant Pepper photos, uh, right? There is a rumor that I'm coming to believe more and more that they may be doing speedballs, which is coke and heroin combined. But LSD alone, you know, like I said, and it, my friends and I, we had a bit of a phase, and we kind of overdid it, and it, it just has such a dramatic effect on you. But when you're with the right people and I always think you need to be in nature. I'm, I'm not giving advice, by the way, to, to our younger listeners. They were Anthony's to, acting as a guy right now. Yeah, listen to my voice. No, but we, when, when we'd have a nice group of people, and we had like a real tight group of five or six of us, and we were very, very close friends, and we felt very comfortable, we'd go to a very safe environment, go out into a field, and it really is just, I don't want to sound like I'm advocating it because I'm kind of neutral about drugs. I think it's drugs you should 100% avoid. But if you're an experimental type of person, you're probably going to find your way there anyway. But um, just to say that, you know, it does open portals. And on the drug show, we were saying that it doesn't create music. You don't just take LSD and suddenly you're John Lennon or whatever. Or I would just say that from what we know of Elvis and John, they were both searchers, you know. I, right. It's interesting that John... And George, and I guess to a degree, I think we've now established that Paul took LSD much earlier than we thought. Yeah, December 65, we're fairly sure, which means he had taken it by the time of Revolver, which sort of changes it. Right, bit, but. right. So it's interesting that the Beatles would take that experience with them into the studio and create something like Tomorrow Never Knows, whereas Elvis would drop acid and then have to show up on the set of Harem Scarum. <laughs> very interesting yeah yeah dressed as a rudolph valentino and fight a stuffed animal that we're all supposed to believe is a tiger that must have been a hell of a letdown <laughs> <laughs> right right so that's, that's uh, that seems to be a running theme after that initial success in the 1950s and with the elvis's back album in 1960 which i still think is one of his greatest records but there seems to be 
just a series of letdowns. <laughs> We're getting to that brief moment where things seem to be turning around for Elvis, and then, then the letdowns continue until the ultimate letdown. Yeah. But interesting with Tomorrow Never Knows, because there's a Bill Hicks skit where he says, you know, if you're against drugs and you're going to judge people who take drugs, then throw all your 60s albums away. He's making a serious point, you know, People who are against drugs, I'd, I'd bet my bottom dollar they've enjoyed records that were made with some sort of influence. I mean, Tomorrow Never Knows surely could not have happened or existed in its form without them experimenting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not isolated to rock music either. Certainly your jazz musicians <laughs> yeah. were down that road long before, and you can hear that in the music as well before the Beatles were even a thought. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, when we did the drug show, we sort of went chapter by chapter, which was more or less drug by drug. And it was always uh, the jazz and blues artists were doing heroin in the 20s or whatever it was. You know? <laughs> right, right. They don't get quite as much uh, press. That's right. Yeah. If you take John Coltrane, for example, who I'm, I'm a huge fan of, mm. such a huge fan. I can't remember the name of the album I was going to say, but what were the albums? Of the Love Supreme? I think it was just after that was his kind of real LSD phase. What's the one, Venus? Yeah, I'm such a big fan. Anyway, uh, he, he <laughs> made some very sort of this kind of psychedelic jazz, I don't know if that's the name of a genre, where his experiences really took the genre, you know, jazz. You know, he's going a long way from Louis Armstrong or Benny Goodman, you know. It's right. really as far as you can go, remaining in roughly the same genre, you know. And these albums, they're not the easiest things to listen to, you know. I mean, I'd say tomorrow. Well, of course, right. I'd say tomorrow. No, is is fairly accessible. You know, it's got a nice melody, etc. And in fact, you know, Junior Parker did a cover of that, which doesn't have any of the sort of adornments and tape loops. It's just all the verses, and it sounds great. So there must be some good melody. But Coltrane, brought up the Coltrane discography for you, and and perhaps it's <laughs> Ascension. Probably, yeah. I think there's two or three. If you look, 66, 66. Yeah, Ascension, there's Kulu Se Mama, Meditations, and Expression. Well, these sound like LSD-expired titles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Meditations as well, yeah. Not that you need to take drugs to meditate, because Ravi Rav right. Shankar didn't like that. Oh, look at these titles, yeah. Transition, <laughs> Sunship, Living yeah. Space, Om, oh, Stellar Regions. Hmm, yeah. not very subtle. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was going to say Ravi Shankar in one of the on the Dick Cavett show actually. I don't think Ravi Shankar ever got too annoyed about anything, but he had a slight hint of annoyance in his voice that people thought he had to take drugs to appreciate Indian music. Right. I think certain drugs, yeah, LSD, they can tie in with a spiritual quest for sure. Whereas you know, coke or speed, probably not. Right. <laughs> anyway, so let's get to the '68. Now, presumably, it wasn't called the Comeback Special at the time, was it? Or was no, it? it was called Singer Presents Elvis. It was sponsored by right. Singer Sewing Machines, yes. The comeback happened a little earlier because the way that the situation was set up, Elvis was exclusively making soundtrack albums for films. That was it. So while Rubber Soul's coming out and Revolver and all those aftermath by the Stones and on and on and on, yeah. uh, Elvis is releasing Double Trouble and Harem Scarum. <laughs> but they would be short of songs, so he would need to flesh out the album. So he would go into the studio and record things that he had an interest in, which was unique at that time. And that's really when the comeback started around 66, when he started recording songs like Guitar Man and Big Boss Man, Down in the Alley. These were all either country or blues songs that harken back to his earlier sound. So Elvis was already headed in this nostalgia for his own career, really, in 66, 67. Wow, and it I called, yes. No, I, say, I didn't know that, and I don't, probably the listeners wouldn't know that, because I think we always think that suddenly it appeared in 68, but that's interesting. No, yeah, it was, it was a slow build to that. In fact, BMG put out a compilation years ago called Tomorrow is a Long Time. Mm -hmm. It was at that time that Elvis recorded Dylan's Tomorrow is a Long Time, which is a stunning recording. I know that mm -hmm. Dylan said it was his favorite cover of any, of any song that anybody has done of his. And they put out all of those songs, and then they had to flesh it out with some material that didn't really fit that theme. But you can hear it. It's very acoustic-based, those sessions, and the songs that Elvis was recording. They had their own spirit. They had their own vibe. Mm -hmm. And 
very clearly it sounded like a guy trying to reclaim his career with the cards he was dealt, which yeah. was trying to fill out albums. So you'd have the Clambake soundtrack, and there are some terrible songs on there. There's a song called Confidence, which is a rewrite of the Frank Sinatra song, High Hopes. And it's so blatant that I'm surprised somebody didn't get sued. But you would have some of this pretty awful material. And then out of nowhere, Bob Dylan. And tomorrow is a long time. <laughs> so you're thinking, what is it doing on this record? So it wasn't until years later that BMG collected that material and released the album that should have come out in 1967, instead of being spread out over a bunch of soundtracks and getting lost in the shuffle. So most people at that time, if they weren't buying the Clambake soundtrack, and it was a lot of people, they were not hearing this development that was going on. So the 68 comeback special really did seem like this phoenix rising from the ashes. The 68 comeback special that we know and love now mm. is not what the colonel envisioned. He envisioned a Christmas special. Yeah, absolutely. Like a Perry Como style Christmas special where <laughs> Elvis sings a bunch of Christmas songs with fake snow and said, oh, good night, everybody. And there's everybody applauds. Yeah. Instead, we got, through Steve Binder's efforts, a man trying to regain his career, clawing his way back to relevance. Well, let me just jump in, because um, I will link to your interview with Steve Binder. Before I give you my thoughts, could you give us a couple of tidbits from the interview or any bits that stand out? Well, I know that Steve Binder was not an Elvis fan, he was into the music that was happening at that time. And when Elvis went to meet him at the studio, Elvis was looking at, because Steve was involved in the record industry as well, Elvis was looking at the gold records that were around his office on the walls. And Elvis asked Steve Bender, what do you think of my career? And Steve told him, I think your career is in the toilet. Wow. And Elvis laughed and said, I'm going to like working with you. So Elvis had an ally in Steve Binder because Elvis was going up against the colonel. And Steve, I don't know if he saw it this way, but this is how I see it. Steve was almost like a surrogate for Elvis in these right. battles with the colonel. The colonel would say, you're not going to do this. You're not going to be singing this song. You're going to be doing Christmas music. And Elvis would sit there silently and not say anything. And then as soon as the colonel was out of the room, he would turn to Steve Bender and say, forget all of that. Whatever you want to do, Steve, that's what we're going to do. Wow, so for the first time in a long time, Elvis had an ally in the industry. You know, his friends and the Memphis Mafia were his allies, but they didn't have any power. Now he had someone that had power. That was a, obviously a threat to the colonel. So that relationship was short-lived <laughs> with Steve yeah. Bender. I think Elvis was kind of brainwashed by the colonel at the time where he just was used to doing movies from nine in the morning to five or six in the evening. And he would do anything that they asked him to do because they paid the colonel somewhere around a million dollars a movie. And, uh, you know, the colonel said, you own him from nine to five or something every day he's there. Right. So without question, he was burned out when I met him. He did look fantastic, and he was on his way to Hawaii to tan up and everything. And I felt after the first meeting with Elvis, and the minute he walked into my office, it was, hi, Steve, and a hi, Elvis. You know, I didn't put him on a pedestal. I, I was really honest with him. I told him, you know, I was a West Coast kid into Jan and Dean and the Beach Boys, not Elvis Presley. Uh, and I, I think everybody knows the initial story, which is he said, what do you think of my career? And I said, I think it's in the toilet, truthfully. <laughs> and at first I thought he was going to kill me. And then he just broke out laughing and said, hey, I think we're going to hit it off. I was watching a man rediscover himself where he realized it wasn't Colonel Parker's genius management. It wasn't RCA Records publicity machine. It was him. You know, he could feel the vibes in the room. He could feel the magic and the audience reaction. Nowadays, when they do a show, they have a warm-up person who tells the audience what's expected of them and, you know, applaud loudly and laugh loudly and so forth. We didn't do any of that. We just had real people <laughs> sitting there. And it was a case of where when we started uh, with the live audience taping the stand-up section and the acoustic section, the audience was almost so stunned. They were, they were 
almost silent. I mean, it was like, you know, they weren't believing their eyes that they were so intimately watching Elvis perform. And uh, little by little, they were, you know, going nuts. The bits I remember, because I, I did listen through the interview, Steve Binder mm. considered it a very positive experience. And I think he said something about, he thought that in the end, Elvis died of boredom. I mean, that's nearly a decade later, but he also said he had, uh, you know, it, or what people call the ingredient X, or whatever you want to call it. That's just clear. I mean, if I can give you just my observations, I mean, sure. I think the bit where they're sort of doing the kind of unplugged thing, even though it's an electric right. car, but what do you call it? In the round. In the round, yeah. And Elvis has got the black leather. I mean, for me, this is his peak. I mean, if, if you look at him there next to 1956, he was great in 56. He kind of looks like a boy, you know. This is a man, you know. And yes. I'm reminded of, uh, have you seen the movie True Romance? Right, yes. Yeah, yes. It's, uh, I, I think Tarantino wrote that. He wrote it, but he didn't direct it. That's yes. right. It's um, the guy who killed himself, isn't it? Who the hell is it? Tony Scott, Ridley Scott's brother. Oh, okay. Christian Slate is a big Elvis fan. And, uh, of course, it's got Val Kilmer. I thought that was great. Uh, you, you don't see his yes. face. But every time Christian Slate is in trouble, he goes to the toilet. And the, the spirit of Elvis is kind of going, oh, you're doing great, man. Don't worry. And, uh, <laughs> So lonely, so lonely, I could die. Well, can you live with it? What? I said, can you live with it? Live with what? That son of a bitch walking around beating the same air as you. Getting away with it every day. Are you haunted? Yeah. You want to get on the haunted? Oh, yeah. Well, I'd kill him. Shoot him in the face. Put him down like a dog. I can't believe what you're telling me. See, not the same that I do. I do want to kill him, but I don't want to spend the rest of my life in jail. Hey, man, I don't blame you. I thought I'd get away with it. Get away with it? Killing's a hard part. Getting away with it, it's easy. Christian Slater says something like, oh, you know, I'm not gay, but if I was going to fuck a guy, I'd fuck Elvis. <laughs> and I'm heterosexual, but I must say, you know, there's certain people, you know, you can still appreciate male beauty. Oh, absolutely. I, I remember <laughs> uh, Joe Esposito saying, there's like an Elvis audio book that had interviews with the Memphis Mafia guys. And Joe Esposito said, I don't care what your sexuality was. <laughs> At that moment, Elvis Presley was the best looking person on the planet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'd say there's probably a case for someone like, again, Muhammad Ali. I'm sure we talked about him earlier, didn't we? Right. Unnaturally beautiful and an interesting face. And, an, you know, and Elvis is, I guess we, we talked about this earlier, didn't we? This sort of quite exotic face, slightly ambiguous. Right. Not quite sure exactly where he was from. I think his unease and his nervousness which you can see in that special. I mean, he's not going on there cocksure. I mean, he's dressed to the nines mm. and he looks fantastic, but there is still that humility there. And he's not taking himself so seriously. There are a lot of jokes, but that's actually endearing. It actually makes him more attractive yeah. that he's not in there throwing it around. Like I'm here, I'm here girls. You know, he's seems very, very down to earth very approachable, very laid back. And I don't think he ever sounded better. I like the rasp in his voice that I guess must have come from all those rehearsals because he hadn't really had to sting like that and, you know, for as long a period of time and a short period of time than he had on that special. And I do like that weather-beaten sound of his voice. It's really great. Yeah, and he kind of starts this thing that became a bit of a trademark of this sort of informal telling stories you know, very unplugged. I mean, you know, I'm sure we, a lot of people have said it's almost the first MTV unplugged. Right. Albeit with an elect, one electric guitar there. But, um, of course, tragically later, which we'll get to, these sort of dialogues with the audience became this horrible, you can listen on YouTube, it's horrible to listen oh, to. Oh, yeah. These yeah. rambling, obviously drug-induced, I don't even know how to describe them, just sort of rambling about various points of his life. But there was one interesting thing. You see him playing acoustic guitar. Apparently, he swapped guitars with Scotty, and he's playing the electric guitar, and they were supposed to swap back. But Elvis <laughs> hung on to the electric. And Elvis is actually a pretty good electric guitar player because you don't have to be technically brilliant to sound right. quite distinctive. And I kind of like what he's doing there. You know, It's simple, but it's, it's good. I've heard other guitar players say that too, that watching <laughs> that uh, footage and being surprised that Elvis could even play at all somehow 
it's become, I guess because later he would come out with an acoustic and do CC Rider and nobody heard the acoustic. And sometimes he would even joke and he does it on the Ed Sullivan show where he flips the guitar around oh, yeah. and he's, he's strumming the back of the guitar. Ha ha ha. I'm not really playing. So oh, I yeah. guess there was this idea that he couldn't actually play. So it's a revelation I suppose to uh, to some people that he can, you know, he's not going to give Scotty Moore a run for his money. Yeah, but he's certainly competent. But you know, rhythm guitar is an art. I mean, not every yeah. lead guitarist can play rhythm guitar. You know, well, Jimi Hendrix was a fantastic rhythm guitarist. There's a few videos of people replicating his rhythm guitar parts, and it's just wonderful. song do they do the song baby what do you want me to do oh that yes first, they do that a lot yeah yeah there's a bit on that where he's he's doing a few runs you know he's, he's doing a right. little bit more than chords anyway but i said the overall effect with the you know with the black leather which you kind of think was passe but again it's a sort of retro when it's retro you can kind of get away with it because you're obviously looking right back he's harking back to what he was but like i say he's much more of an adult now he's got that um he looks very worldly you know, he's done a lot of living, obviously. He's done all these terrible movies. And I think the other thing that makes it so good is, is the fact that he hadn't, as you said, he hadn't done it for so long. Yes. So, you know, he's rusty in one sense in that the performances, you know, if you were going to nitpick, they're not perfect. But they got this guy who's, who's very happy to be back doing this thing that he hasn't done for, you know, nigh on 10 years. Right. And playing blues songs and mm. country music songs and songs that were in his repertoire that he, he hadn't touched in so many years. So yeah. it introduced him to a whole new audience, yeah. kick-started another part of his career. I, I do wonder what Jim Morrison must have thought of that outfit, because <laughs> Jim, Jim was going around in a leather suit, certainly in the year before, or Diana Rigg, for that matter. <laughs> yeah, from the Avengers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, jokey aside, I mean, I'm sure Jim Morrison took a lot from Elvis, so I suppose. Oh, he puts Elvis down as his favorite vocalist in the uh, Electra bio, 67, when, or 66, when they signed. And... According to some biographies, when an Elvis song came on the radio, he made everyone in the room stand to attention because part of Jim's military background as well. <laughs> it's a shame those two didn't meet. I know that Elvis liked Jim Morrison, particularly the song Touch Me, which I could see Elvis doing. Oh, yeah. Come on, come it's, on, come it's, on. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, it's totally made for him. For sure. But I, I think he said something about uh, Jim Morrison, which I thought was odd, saying, I like, this is according to the Memphis Mafia, I like Jim Morrison's voice. He's got a good voice. I just don't like the political stuff. And I'm thinking, what is he talking about? Unknown Soldier, I guess? I, I don't know specifically what song he would have been referring to. Maybe Five to One as well. Yeah, I don't maybe, remember the lyrics maybe. exactly, but, you know, they got the guns, we got the numbers. Gonna win, yeah, we're taking over. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like but Elvis. They, but yes, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But they yeah. also both had trouble in Florida yeah. with the cops breaking up Elvis's. He, Elvis couldn't move down in Florida. He had to stand still and perform because they were filming him thinking he was going to be lewd. And, of course, Jim Morrison famously didn't do anything, but the word came out that he exposed himself. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Right. Oh, wonderful. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> I guess we should mention cool. that he, Elvis did, he closed the special with If I Can Dream, 
which was inspired by the assassination of Martin Luther King. So mm-hmm. this, for a guy who had avoided politics, and I know he comes into criticism for not saying anything regarding the civil rights movement at that time, but then again, Elvis didn't give long-form interviews, and he was busy making harem scarum, not really involved in anything going on culturally. But he did make that statement, and that, of course, would lead inevitably to the next series of sessions, and then in the ghetto, which I'm surprised the colonel allowed him to do. But at that point, I think Elvis was emboldened to record what he wanted to. I know there were fights over suspicious minds because the publishing deal that the colonel set up required that Elvis Presley's publishing company receive some of the copyright. So that worked for the movie songs because those writers were only happy to give up their copyright. When we were getting into 69 sessions, and songs like Suspicious Minds and the 67 Guitar Man, which was written by Jerry Reed, who's a country music sensation on his own, mm. they were not going to give up the, their copyright. Right. And there were a lot of arguments back and forth between the Colonel and those songwriters. And Elvis basically told the Colonel, I'm going to record what I want. I don't care anymore. So that's an example of Elvis finally putting his foot down and trying to reclaim his career. So then we get things like Suspicious Minds, which wouldn't have happened a few years earlier because there would have been a copyright issue. I'd love to ask you more about the psychology of Elvis and the Colonel, but unfortunately we do. That could be a whole show, but yeah, we can move on. But Elvis came back. Yeah, That's basically the... (laughs) Just one thing before we get to Vegas. I did have to laugh. In January 69, Elvis recorded, uh, I think it was 36 tracks, including Yesterday and Hey Jude. And I think I mentioned earlier, you did a nice version of Get Back at some point. But I had to laugh because, of course, January 69 is the famous month where the Beatles were struggling to right. match together. <laughs> I've got through all the Nagger reels that are online so far, and I'm up to about January 22nd. It's absolutely fascinating, amazing. A bit hard to summarize, but as I'm putting out shows, I'm kind of talking about it a little bit in my introductions. But uh, All right, so let's get to Vegas. Uh, as I was saying earlier, I think it's unfortunate that the sort of fat guy in the jumpsuit image is sort of caught on with the public, if you want to call it that. But it all started so well at the International, which became the Hilton mm-hmm. later, August 69, same month as Woodstock, interestingly. And uh, the notes I've got here, Sam Phillips, of course, way back at, from Sun Records, was there. Elvis was dressed in a karate outfit. His sort of Vegas act, I don't, I don't know if it changed, but it, it was sort of some current hits. I'm sure Suspicious Minds was in there old rockers and then he, he sort of chose his covers quite carefully including yes. as he said some beatles songs so it feels like it was a very say all-round entertainer but not yes i was going way. to use the same expression yeah yeah but more in a kind of all-encompassing mm-hmm. almost like something for everyone for authority just uh, some of these stats are just absolutely unbelievable so in 71 the international became the hilton 1500 rooms the largest showroom in vegas I've got here, Elvis Presley never played to an empty seat. A total of 2.5 million customers went through the doors. He could sell out 60 shows in 10 minutes. That could be a bit fanciful, but anyway. He played 56 to 60 shows a month, so essentially two a night for six years. Got here, 837 sold-out performances in all, plus he did do tours in between the Vegas shows. And he'd previously done 31 films in 13 years, so uh, you could never say he wasn't a hard worker. Went from one treadmill to another treadmill. Yeah, exactly. Uh, With this short, sweet spot in the middle, you know. Just one other thing. um, I'm just going to read his outfit. This wasn't on the first night, but this was his Vegas outfit. Elvis sparkled on stage in one of his handcrafted, jewel-encrusted jumpsuits, all of which he gave exotic names, like the high priest of a fabulous futuristic cult. And he also wore embroidered capes and later colorful scarves. The outfit was rounded off with a thick belt embossed with heraldic eagles and shields and dripping with gold chains. And around his neck, a gem-studded collar, great gold crucifixes, and a star of David and Hebrew symbol. The effect of his shows fused the pomp of a coronation with the passion of a religious revival. Quite amazing. (laughs) And then obviously dyed his hair jet black. Fingers jangled with rings. Put Ringo to shame, by the way. (laughs) His clothes were covered with jewels. He wore Elvis, what we call now Elvis shades, which I've had a couple of pairs of those. These are kind of big shades. Right. Scarlet ruffled shirts and carried a cane with a silver diamond-eyed bulldog's head for a handle. Wow. 
Is yeah. there anything you could tell us about sort of the early Vegas shows? When do you think it was a turning point? When do you think the demise started happening? Well, those early ones were a triumph. He was very much influenced by Tom Jones. Right. And at that point, and, and I know people will talk about Elvis versus the Beatles. In fact, we're kind of talking about it in a way, but, but mm. not really versus. But at that point, it really was Elvis and Tom Jones. That, that was really the big rivalry. It was a friendly rivalry, but I think he based a lot of his Vegas act on what Tom was doing, mm. seeing Tom as his almost natural successor. But those shows were pretty electric. And Richard Zoglin, I interviewed him as well. And Richard Zoglin says, it's interesting that Elvis put that show together himself. He put the band together himself. He chose the great guitarist, James Burton, who worked mm. with Ricky Nelson before that and who's legendary, all those great musicians, Ronnie Tut. He had gospel groups with him as backup singers. He had, for African-American group, the Sweet Inspirations. Then he had the gospel quartet, the Imperials, then later J.D. Sumner and the Stamps. Elvis always wanted to be a member of a gospel quartet. Now he was in a position where he could live out that fantasy on stage mm. and have not one, but two. <laughs> and Zoglin mentions in his book, Elvis in Las Vegas, that he finds it interesting that Elvis did not have an old Vegas hand helping him to put that show together. That that was really Elvis Presley's creation. So those early shows were all triumphs. I mean, Elvis, as you mentioned, was working a lot of shows. Yeah. Too many. I understand the demand was there, but that doesn't mean you have to work a guy into a stupor and the next step was to take that show on the road and now you have even more pressure and there were films being made of those shows you know the movie career was continuing to some degree there was that's the way it is i was gonna say uh, that's a good one that's 1970 yeah, isn't it yeah that's a really good one it still elvis looks on, amazing though he still, still, still looks, looks yeah still looks great uh on the elvis on tour documentary that's 72 you know a little bloated maybe Certainly by today's standards, he would not be considered overweight. I know when Elvis played Madison Square Garden in 72, that was a very, very big deal mm. because he felt that New York and the New York critics had always looked down on him. And the New York Times had the headline mentioned uh, that description of his sartorial splendor on stage. The New York Times called him the prince from another planet which, which oh, is also great. a good description of how he looked at that time and that's where we're going to leave it that was episode 58 and part two of three of the ballad of john and elvis so we've left elvis at the beginning of his las vegas stint more or less at the end of the 60s there i'm afraid the rot starts to set in fairly quickly in the 70s i'm sure a lot of you already know the story and it's sad, but also very compelling. And that's what we'll cover in the final part of this story. Of course, there's a lesson to be learned that never really gets learned if you look at Michael Jackson and Amy Winehouse and many other cases since. We put these people on a pedestal and we expect far too much of them. You know, we find them to be all too human. From today's episode, I'll forever have the image of the Beatles and Elvis jamming as Sergeant Presley's lonesome heartbreak band which I think is a fantastic name that came from that Elvis Meets the Beatles book that I've been referencing. I have to say, though, that book, as we've seen in today's episode and we'll see in the next one, it really did play up the supposed feud between John and Elvis, which I'm not sure was really there. Perhaps it was a little bit, but I don't think it was really a direct thing. We'll cover next time Elvis famously going to see President Nixon and warning him of the hippies corrupting America's youth. I don't know how much he name-checked John himself, but... Perhaps Ghosty will tell us more in the next part. There will be more John and Elvis next time. And we're going to look at their parallel lives, let's call it, in the 70s. And the Coleman Goldman thing, I'm afraid, will come up again. <laughs> Just can't let it go. One of the things Ghosty mentioned in this episode, I can't remember if I edited it out or if it was in the conversation, was that he said that he wished that they'd make a, a biopic of the Beatles meeting Elvis. And there is a radio show from the BBC which I will link in the show notes, which Mick Ord alerted me to. And it's an hour long and it's pretty good. I've also put in the show notes some of Elvis's covers of the songs we mentioned, so Bridge Over Trouble Water, Get Back, and the Dylan song Tomorrow is a Long Time. The next show, of course, will be John and Elvis, part three. I might try and get it out around 
Elvis's posthumous birthday, which is the 8th of January. Of course, that won't mean too much if you're listening after that date, but anyway, <laughs> nice bit of symbolism at least. I thought I'd just tell you actually some of the shows that were coming up. I managed to get quite a few recorded in December, so I won't be recording anymore for a couple of months, I don't think. I'm sure I've said that before. <laughs> but uh, to give you the full list, so the next one's coming up is Al Sussman, Ken Womack, talking about his John Lennon 1980 book. Then there's Dan Richter, I talked to again about the concept of genius Matt Sergio that talk was about the occult or conspiratorial aspects of Beatles research and then there's a follow up with Caitlin Hare as promised with lots more stuff about Sean and Goldman and Fred Seaman and others so just remains for me to say thank you very much for listening please subscribe, rate, review the show is picking up very nicely We've had a real upsurge recently, and thanks to all of you for listening this year and for all the feedback you've given me. I really do appreciate it, and it's nice to know that you're getting a lot out of these shows. I think beyond John Lennon as well, I've had some messages which suggest that the stuff I talk about where I branch off from the central topic is valuable to you. I do have a lot to say. I've accumulated over 30 years or so of observing society in the context of John and the Beatles, but a lot of stuff beyond that as well. And uh, this is a wonderful outlet for me, so I'm certainly getting as much or more out of it as you wonderful listeners. So I'm just going to say Happy New Year. I will see you very soon, and take care. Goodbye. Goodbye.